talk about the unexplainable explained in the next three weeks, and we're kicking this series off on the Holy Spirit uh, today on Pentecost, on Shavuot, as she said. That's a special day in our calendar. How many of you have had your life, show of hands, impacted? This is a a tough question here, I know. You've had your life impacted in a way that you can't explain only other than the work of the Holy Spirit. Put your hand up. Your life has been impacted. Put your hand up and leave it up. Your life has been impacted in a way that you cannot explain other than the unexplainable being explained with uh, what? Holy Spirit. Put your hand up. Leave it up. Okay, one more time. And now look around. Okay, put your hand down. I think sometimes when I think about these places and spaces when we're here at Summit, one of the words comes up a lot when it comes to success or being a healthy church. All of the ideas of success. I mean, it happens in your business, it happens in your life, and, you know, people have even said to me at, like, district council or things I've been to, hey, you know, things are going great at Summit. It's really successful. I'm like, really? How do you, how do you, how do you know? Do you come? <laughs> are you, are you a part of our family? Does that make sense? And I will say this to you, I measure success in a couple different ways as a church when it comes to our health, not you know, bussed in seats, but but sent from those seats. I mean, there's all different ways I could talk about this, but one of the reasons or one of the things I think we need to be successful about is not just attendance, but an adherence to the Holy Spirit. It's important that we don't merely show up, but he shows through. And there's another thing that people talk about a lot in the American church here in the West And I use that term because it happens, that church becomes a place for people to be entertained, like a production company, or you come and you get to stream a service, and no offense if you're watching online, you get to come and watch when church is a full contact participatory sport. The idea of it being an event for people versus a self-sacrificing group of people. That's different. We talked about that last week when it comes to sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice, death, dying to ourselves. How do we do that? We have our gifts. We realize they're not for us, but they're for who? Others. That's how we live this out. And there were three altars I talked about, protection. You don't remember. You'll have to watch it. There's three altars that get in the way of us from living out these, these, group, th- this, uh, these gifts, right? Being the sa- sacrificial person. So um, I hear this a lot sometimes for churches or, or other leaders or especially people that come into Summit and you talk to me about now that you're here at Summit. Now Summit isn't just a building. It's a group of people that gather here at the building. Summit is not a church brick and mortar. It's a group of people. That's you. You're part of that. And when you journey through things like the expedition, you see how you fit. But I hear this a lot. I came to Summit. And something isn't missing there. Like, what? What do you mean? I go to these other churches, and it just feels like something's missing. But I came to Summit, and it's like, like God just had something for me. Like, I know I'm supposed to be here. Do you know that you're not here by accident? You're a visitor here today. And you're not here by accident. You didn't just wander into Summit. I mean, maybe you wandered actually into Summit. But the truth is you're not here by accident. And a lot of times these things people are trying to articulate where something's missing, what they're really trying to say is someone is missing. That someone is an adherence to the Holy Spirit. Because they're... There again, I've been in those situations. You've maybe experienced those situations where it's to have a form of godliness but to deny its power. It's all polished and great, but at the same time, it feels so bankrupt and shallow. And I can't do what the Holy Spirit does. And I think a lot of times those things that people are talking about that are missing, it's not something that's missing. Sometimes it's actually someone that's missing. 
And I know that might sound a little bit harsh, but the Holy Spirit is one of the most uniting topics that we will talk about. What are you all doing here today? Why are you here? You are here because the Holy Spirit gives community where there would be no community. That's why you're here. The Holy Spirit's working in this church to give community where there is no community. And it's also the most uh, unifying topic, but it can also be the most dividing topic. I mean, the Holy Spirit will never sponsor a public display, by the way, that will drive someone from Christ. But we will. The Holy Spirit will never do that, but we certainly love to do that, operate in the flesh. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? So I really want to handle this with an element of humility, not in the sense that we've got it cornered and we're this church on summit and we know what we're doing and that's something you're missing is here, it's the someone, it's the Holy Spirit. I'm not trying to juxtapose us versus them or this church or that church or this denomination or that denomination. I'm trying to show you what the promise of the Holy Spirit is according to the text because some of us, you well, may not know that there was this promise. We'll talk about the person and the purpose, but today I focus slowly on the promise. I don't, um, I want you to know I, I don't take this responsibility lightly, Hebrews 13, 12. And I want you to know that I don't want what is coming down the road for us as a church to be explainable without the Holy Spirit. I don't want to have an article that the district sent out today uh, in June, you know, about biblical literacy, and they highlighted Summit, and it was cool, and I was up front, like, looking real holy like this in a linen shirt, and then there was a bass player over there that you could infer that was Danielle on the bass, but it was actually Lisa, yeah, that's Andy's wife, He's, he, he, he cheered for her. But I don't want to like sit down with another pastor years from now and go, man, what, what went on at Summit? Give me the play-by-play. -play. Show me the A to B to B to C to C to D. I mean, there are all those things in the natural we can do organizationally, and we can offer our gifts as the best, but I don't want it to be explained without the work of the Holy Spirit. I want to sit back and go, we, we just showed up and, and invested, and God showed off and displayed. I don't want to live in such a way here at this church that my life is explainable without the Holy Spirit. I want to be the man off stage over there who I am on stage right here. I want to be the same guy at my house and the same guy here. I don't want my life explainable without the Holy Spirit. I, I want to live deeper because some of you know the pendulum I swing on, my high highs and my low lows. My wife knows and in those moments, I want to I be a better follower of Christ and have the Holy Spirit do something in me that, he's, that he, he hasn't done yet. And you look at my life and you go, man, Eric, you, you've grown. God is doing something in you. I don't want my life to be explainable with the Holy Spirit. Do you? Do you want your life to be explainable without God's power in it? There's a promise here. So let's talk about Shavuot Sunday the next few weeks, the person, the promise, or Shabbat, if you want to get real fancy. There's a Hebrew calendar here that we're on, and there's 50 days, 49 technically, because Kim said it started yesterday, but 50 calendar days after Easter, there is what is called Shabbat. It's the first month, uh, Nisan is the month, and they actually start counting in Egypt. So go back to Exodus 12, open your Bible. If you don't have your Bible, Turn on your phone. Exodus 12, verse 1. You can see how this calendar year is established. Now, just for way of, um, you could say, reference here for you, it's May or April. Does that make sense? It's May or April to us, but here in Exodus 12, it's the first month for them. This is important to note. The Lord said to Moses, Exodus 12, 1, and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. 
So they start counting in Egypt in Exodus 12, 1. It's the first month. It's Nisan. Now let's go to the second month. Exodus 16. Flip a few pages. Exodus 16, verse 1. They set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Iliam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month. There is a second month. Uh, it's Iyer, um, I-Y-A-R, and it's April or May, and we find this in Exodus 16. So you, you, you go back to Shavat, and you go to the first Passover, and then we get to the second month, and then let's get to the third month, or the 50 days after the first Passover, which is the celebration of, of Shavat. So you need to go to uh, Exodus 19, verse 1. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt. Remember, they started counting in Egypt. It was the first month, second month, third month. Here's where we're at, the third month. God says to them, seven weeks after Passover, it's the Feast of Harvest. This is this whole point in the calendar year where Shavuot is being celebrated. And what is Shavuot or Shavuot really being celebrated today on the Jewish calendar, the third month out of Exodus from 12 to 19.1? What what are they really celebrating? Kim, talk to you about it. Cheesecake. Hands down, 10 times out of 10. No, they're celebrating the giving of the what? Torah on Mount Sinai. This is the celebration 50 days after the first Passover in Exodus 12 to Exodus 19, where now we're going to celebrate the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai. And this giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai was a covenant agreement with God and, and people. It was, um, it was like a marriage covenant. It was like the hopeful springtime, if you will, of their relationship. They were honeymooning at this point. But it didn't, it didn't stay that way. So the question is, what happened at Mount Sinai. So if Shavuot or Shavuot, 50 days after Passover, is today, and we're counting from Exodus 12, what happened at at Sinai? That's the question I have to ask you. What happened at Sinai during the giving of the Torah? Let's let's look to the text. Exodus 19, verse 1, we've read it. Exodus 10, the Lord says to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them. Have them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. Has anyone got your house ready for someone to come over? That's basically what they're doing. God's coming over and they're going to get their house ready. You come over to my house uninvited, I'm not home. (laughs) My car's in the driveway. You can see me in the kitchen. I'm not coming to the door. I have not consecrated anything. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. Verse 14, so Moses went down from the mountain with these instructions. You guys got to get ready. Consecrate your people. Be ready for the third day. Verse 15, chapter 20 of the book of Exodus. Be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. God didn't say that, by the way. Moses did. Because he knows, guys. I thought that was a joke. All right, you guys are all... I love that that Moses is like, all right, listen, if there's one thing, guys, that you got to do, just don't go near a woman. (laughs) Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it on fire. Verse 18. The Lord came down from Mount Sinai and the Lord called up to Moses, uh, to come up the mountain, and Moses went up, so he comes down, he comes up, and then God spoke to the word, saying, I am the Lord God, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and you have, and should have, no other gods before me. He gives us the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. Now, a couple things to note, just real quick, about the thunder and the lightning, or the thunder and the fire and the wind. There are some people that are rabbis that interpret thunder um, as voices. The word in the Hebrew could be associated with voice. 
And there are some rabbis that have said that they heard here in the giving of the Torah, the thunder, in all 70 different voices so all the world could hear the giving of the Torah. So something is in the ether when it comes to languages and tongues and thunder and fire and wind and this promise of Shavuot. Now, I don't want to bore you with the details, but uh, Exodus 21, uh, 22, 23, you can flip them. It's a bunch of laws and promises. Moses goes down, brings leaders up in Exodus 24, and then Exodus 25, uh, through really, honestly, Exodus 31. You can go all the way from 25 to 31, and it's really God's plans and, and process. He's given him uh, the promise, and then he's given him the how-to. Does that make sense? And those chapters, God's laying it out, and then we finally get to Exodus 32, which is what we're celebrating today as the giving of the Torah, part of Mount Sinai. When Moses, when the people saw that Moses was delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together and Aaron and, sa- and said to him, make us a God so we can have it. Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. So Aaron said to him, take off rings that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, which by the way, uh, ear piercing uh, through the nose or through the ears was a symbol of that you were well submissive or owned or in slavery so take off the form of slavery uh, a symbol of slavery and we're going to make it into something else that we can be enslaved to the the rings here aren't just gold that they had along they're symbolic for a role they had on that journey or in that place in society he says give us those rings and tell them to bring them to me exodus 32 4 and he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it okay aaron received the gold from their hand remember this and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf the lord said to moses go down your people are jacking this up verse 11 moses argues before the lord come on Lord, I know they're jacking this up, but don't jack them up. Then Moses, verse 15, Moses turned and went down from the mountain with two tables of the testimony uh, in his hand, written on both sides. And as soon as he came near the camp and he saw the calf dancing, Moses' anger burned hot. He threw the tablets, broke them. He took the calf they had made and burned it with fire and ground it into powder, and then scattered it on the water, and made the people of Israel drink it. Yikes. I mean, has your grandmother ever put soap in your mouth? This is next level. You know, what he really does is what we do to our dog if you've ever had a new puppy. Has anyone ever had a new puppy where you were delayed coming home? Moses is up the mountain. He's delayed, just like your dog, because you were delayed. It's a new puppy. And what does a puppy do? A puppy can't control a few of its functions usually. And so the puppy has an accident somewhere in your house. And what do you do to the puppy? Well, if you're not Caesar, okay, the dog whisperer, or you're going to give this dog a like trauma he's got to work through his kennel counselor with someday. You take the dog by the scruff of the neck and you bring it over to where the dog dump is in your kitchen and you're like, that's a bad dog. You don't do that. And the dog's like, what? Do what? Be a dog? Wait for you? I mean, I, you were delayed. I couldn't hold it anymore. This is exactly what Moses is doing to what we do with dogs. He's taking and he's making this an absolute object lesson out of anger. He grinds this thing up, scatters before the water, and he makes everybody drink it. Now there's an amazing Jewish quip that says, no affliction that has ever happened 
there was not some particle of the dust of the golden calf in it. This is not just something that happened once. This is something that seems to have perverviated the story for a long, long time. So Moses, at the gates of the camp, he says in Exodus 32, what happens? Exodus 32, verse 24, by the way, I just got to back up. Because Aaron says to him, hey, I told them, let anyone who has gold take it off. And they gave it to me, and I threw it in this fire, and out came a calf. <laughs> okay, let's just put that against the word of God. We do that too sometimes. We say stuff, and then we got to, like, put that saying up against the word of God. People post stuff on Instagram all the time. It sounds good, but if you really think about it, it's like, what? Are you kidding me? Or they post it on their Facebook because it's some quote that's so theologically inept. It, it's kind of like, really? Have you really thought about that? Oh, so this is Aaron in his golden calf for a second. That's just my opinion. Don't look at me like you don't think that too. You remember? He goes, um, see, I said to them, <laughs> I gave it. I just threw it in the fire and shoot, out came this calf, wouldn't you know? And Aaron received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with the graving tool and made the golden calf. What a stinking liar. Uh, it just came out, I guess. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who's on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levite, the Levites, gathered around him. There's implications to this. He said to them, he said to them, different message, different day, on the God of the New Testament and the Old Testament and the justification theologically of what we do when we run into these things. He said to them, go and pick up your sword and go throughout the camp and kill your brother, your companion, your companion and their neighbor. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And that day about 3,000 men of the people died. And then the Lord sent a plague on the people because they made the calf, ending in verse 35 of 32. I love this last sentence. I laughed for at least a half hour, snicker. Then the Lord sent a plague on the people because they made the calf, the one that Aaron made. <laughs> I love that. It's like, we know Aaron. That's what we're celebrating at Shavat. The giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. That's what happened. Moses went up. There's fire. There's wind. There's arguably these things called lightning or thunder, rather, more succinctly stated, that could be interpreted as voices or tongues. So the Torah could be understood. This golden calf shows up. 3,000 people die. And God sends a plague. Now let's go to Pentecost. Okay? 50 days after Easter, it's the same calendar year. It's the same time, Easter, uh, Passover, Shabbat, Pentecost. Kim said it. It's the same, same time, same time today. So now we'll talk about Pentecost. But before, let's just back up just a bit about the promise here that happened on Pentecost. Let's talk a little bit about the promise that led to Pentecost. Luke 3.16, you can go there if you'd like. Um, we're talking about John the Baptist here, Luke 3, 16. John answered to them saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of the sandals, I'm not worthy to untie. And he'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Luke 3, 16. Now, you, you get to the spot where Jesus confirms this in John 14, 25 through 26. These things I've spoken to you while I'm here, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all the things and bring you to remembrance what I've said to you. John 14. So you got John the Baptist saying that there's going to be a promise of one that's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. I'm baptizing you in water, but there's one that's going to baptize you by spirit and fire. This is a promise. Jesus says, he confirms this and says, listen, I am here, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, the one that John's talking about, will do these things, whom the Father will send. John 13, 16. You don't have to flip there. I'll read it for you for the sake of time. John 13, 16. I tell you the truth, for it's your advantage that I go away, that if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I go, 
I will send him to you. There's a promise of the Holy Spirit. There's a promise of Pentecost coming. John the Baptist talked about it. Jesus talked about it. Jesus said, I got to get out of here so it can happen. Jesus' last words, his last words that he even spoke. I remember some months ago, and my aunt and my uncle are here, and for this illustration, I'll just call an audible. I remember walking into the room where my grandfather Marvin was dying. He had Parkinson's, and he was in and out of the world, you could say, in his mental ability. And I walked in the room, and he came into the room. And it's like God told Moses to come up the mountain while he's on the mountain. I mean, you can be geographically present, but emotionally absent. I don't ever want to be that kind of dad, by the way, where my kids have to use my name three or four times before I snap into the room with them. I want to be in the room with them. But my grandfather came to this realization in a matter of seconds when I walked in the room. There was something about our relationship, me and him, the Holy Spirit working this out, that he triggered into the room. He sat up, I remember his face, and he goes, Eric. My grandma Marge just starts to cry. And I remember the last words he told me, you have become a, you've become a, a big boy. No truer words that he ever spoke. You've become a big, big boy. He, he remembered me as a little boy and he saw that boy grow. But those were his last words. I'll never forget them. It was the last time I spoke with them. And if you had to give your last words to somebody, what are you going to give them? What you had for lunch yesterday? You're going to give them something that they can hold on to forever. And Jesus' last words in John 14, excuse me, John, or Luke 24, 49, he says, I am sending the promise. This is post-resurrection. Jesus says this. I'm sending the promise to you. I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you're clothed with power. We'll talk about the purpose uh, and the person of the Holy Spirit. One of the purposes that we're going to dive deep into is being clothed with power. Jesus' last words post-resurrection are like, this is going to happen. Stay in the city until it does. I'm out. And he goes up. Think about that. That has a lot of weight in that moment. So they do that, and now let's go to Acts 1 through 4. We'll do a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but Acts chapter 1, verse 4, and they're staying there uh, with them. And, they, and he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, so they're doing that, but to wait for the promise, Acts 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 4. And he said, you have heard it from me, for John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So then what happens on Acts chapter 2? Many days from then, they're there, at Pentecost, and they arrived, gathered in one place. That's what we're celebrating today, the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai and the... This moment called Pentecost in Acts 2. Is, that, is everyone crystal clear with that right now? You have to be before we move on. Do you have any questions, comments? Okay, save them until the end. The Holy Spirit to begin to, um, the, the Holy Spirit, um, let me just back up here. This is so, this is amazing. We have time. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house with their sitting, and divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each of one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gives them utterance. Now we'll talk a little bit about tongues in week two and week three specifically because there's a personal tongue and there's a prophetic tongue. There are two different things that surface even in Corinthians. This specific miracle here at Pentecost, you can read it for yourself. They're amazed and astonished and they're saying, are all these men who are speaking Galileans, how is it that they know our native language? How are they speaking in the language 
that we all speak. They're speaking in a known language that others understand at Pentecost, and it's an absolute miracle. It's like if you didn't know how to speak Spanish, and all of a sudden you started habla espanol. And it, you, it just started coming out of you and, you, and they're like, how do you know how to speak Spanish? Aren't you, aren't you Norwegian? And you're like, no, I'm Swedish, which is Swedish, you know, Jesus, Jesus, the Swedish name I know. I mean, that's a good one. You can have that one for later. <laughs> but the reality of this, the men of Israel hear these words, verse 22, the men of Israel, they're gathered around, they hear these known languages, these other tongues on this miracle in the upper room, they're filled with the Holy Spirit, and then what happens, verse 33, being exalted at the right hand of the God, uh, he talks about Jesus, the Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit, he's poured out this to you, and to yourselves are seeing and hearing. You're hearing about the promise, you're witnessing what John the Baptist talked about, what Jesus talked about, you're witnessing Pentecost, that's what is happening that's what he's telling everyone who's there, who's, who's gathered. He's talking about the promise. Now, verse 37, they're like, well, they heard this promise, and they were cut to the heart. The Bible says, you need to look at that in your Bible, okay? Acts 1, pull up your Bible. I'll wait. Pull up your Bible on your phone. Acts chapter 2, excuse me, verse 37 underline this they heard this and they were cut to the heart and then he gives them the procedure so he talks about the promise they're cut to the heart and then he gives them the procedure on how to do this repent be baptized and what let's let scripture say repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of jesus for the forgiveness of the sins and you'll receive the gift of the holy spirit repent be baptized and receive Repent, be baptized, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So this happens. And those who were there received this word. They were baptized, and they're added to their number about 3,000 souls. A couple points of, um, you could say, comparison. In Shavuot, Shavuot, 50 days after the first Passover in Exodus 12 to Exodus 19, we see something happening. There is this moment where wind and fire come down, arguably even thunder, possibly interpreted voices or languages, We've got in Pentecost, they're gathered together in the up, upper room. So you've got the same calendar year with the same moment of space and time, and they come together, and they're gathered around a mountain, and they're gathered some men of Israel around a city, and then you've got some people like Moses that are up on the mountain. You've got some people like the disciples that are in the upper room. So you've got people gathered, God's people gathered on both accounts in the city or around the mountain, and then you've got God's persons or disciples up the mountain, and you've got this moment where there's instruction that's given, and then there's this empowerment that's received. And these two things are happening at the same time today. And then you've got um, Moses speaking to the people to join others to slay them. And then you've got this whole other thing where we're speaking to God's people to save them. And then you find even further that they're cut to the heart. At Sinai, they're literally cut to the heart with an actual sword to the actual heart. And then here at Pentecost... They're cut to the heart, but with the Spirit. 3,000 people were slayed on the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai, and at Pentecost, at the promise that's fulfilled, 3,000 people were saved. And these two events just so happen today. 
So let me clarify this for you because I believe this statement is so important that you read it, that I'm going to put it on the screen. The promise of the Holy Spirit changes everything. Acts 2. The promise and the presence of the Holy Spirit changes everything. Let me show you the best way I can figure out this promise for you, okay? Because my, my question today is, is going to help this reality. And with this, I, I'm going to close. So Katie, you can come here and play the, the piano. Let, let's say this is you. You're a cup. You're a vessel. You're a carrier of what? Spirit. You are a carrier of spirit. In the Old Testament, God was in a box. In the New Testament, you are the box. And you're going to carry something. You're going to carry the spirit of the Antichrist, or you're going to carry the spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit. You're going to carry something. It's not up to you uh, that you're going to carry or not. You're going to carry something. And you don't get to choose to be a carrier of spirit because God has made you to carry you are the temple. Your body is housed where this is. And this is you pre-salvation. This is you pre-repent, believe, and receive. This is you walking around your life, meandering your way and how you want. This is what a lot of people live like. It's what? Empty. But you have this encounter with Christ. You have this moment. Confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart. Re repent. Believe. Receive. You have this moment with Christ where you're, it's okay, we have insurance, where you, where you're filled up. You're a carrier of the Holy Spirit. No one doubts that you didn't receive the Spirit on salvation. The Holy Spirit isn't living within you. Does that make sense? Because a lot of people will try and use this promise of the Holy Spirit in a couple different ways, biblically, that isn't biblical they'll try and teach you that somewhere along the line um, when you got saved when you believed or repented and received and you were wild or baptized that 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 is it that's all there is but there is a power encounter there is a moment that shows up in your life that you can't explain. It's the unexplainable and explained. And it's the promise of the Holy Spirit. And the only way I can illustrate it is you are baptized in this liquid love and you don't care if you live or die. And it's this empowerment, not just instruction. And Shavat becomes Pentecost. And you live saturated, overflowing, and it shows up in gifts. And yeah, it shows up in things that we've abused and things that sometimes are strange and it shows up in amazing things that we have got it locked down according to the word but i'm asking you have you had your power encounter with the promise of the holy spirit because if you have not the promise and the presence of the holy spirit will change everything it changed everything on sinai from three thousand people getting slayed to three thousand people getting saved and get out of the reality of all of this stuff where you have all of the baggage and the pre-knowledge and thoughts about what I'm talking about. There is a promise of the Holy Spirit. And it happened, and this can happen for you. And if it has, hasn't happened for you, I guarantee you there is more for you. In Acts 19, 1 through 6, this promise, and it happened to uh, Apollos, uh, at, while was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus and he found some disciples. I have so much water on my iPad right now. He, he found some disciples and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you were, when you believed? And they're like, yeah, I mean, we, we received the Holy Spirit. We're not empty. We were baptized and we believe in Christ. We were, we were baptized in, in John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in the one who's come after him, that is Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized 
In the name of the Lord Jesus, Paul laid his hands on him and the Holy Spirit came upon them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. This happened. This? Have you received the power encounter? We didn't even know there was one. We didn't know there was more. And, And he's like, yeah, there's a lot more. Have you received this? I got a friend named Larry. He grew up Catholic. And in fact, he uh, grew up very Catholic is what he'd like to say. And then he became Lutheran. And I got Luther's thesis on my office door. If you walk by that hall. I've been in Germany. I, I love Lutheran and studying him. But Larry told me, you know, I helped people in their confirmation classes for years. I was a teacher, and I wasn't even saved. This is what he told me. If I had to look at my life, I was not a follower of Jesus. I taught Jesus. I was a faithful Catholic, and then I became Lutheran, but I didn't know who he was. And Larry has this moment in his life where he simply heard not just about salvation, but he heard about the promise. So Larry gives his life to Christ, his life to Christ, not all of the kids that he had confirmed to Christ. He gets baptized in water. He starts reading his word. He starts coming underneath teaching about this subject. And then he is seeking God for himself because he wants the promise. He wants the Not just the instruction, but the empowerment. So he's mowing his yard. And he's mowing his yard, and he's seeking God, and he's listening to music, and he's just pouring out his heart before God. He's just seeking the Lord in prayer. He's seeking his power encounter. He's seeking this picture for his life. And Larry tells this story so eloquently he just says I was mowing my yard and the Holy Spirit came upon me so much so that I had to let go of the mower I couldn't stand I buckled underneath the weight of the reality of the creator of the universe and I had to crawl on my hands and knees groaning moaning I couldn't speak I couldn't even move I couldn't even think I was just immersed in his presence and this thankfulness this encounter with God came over me I shut the mower off I couldn't even pick it up I was an absolute mess from uh, like people must have thought I was having a heart attack because I couldn't get off my yard like God was doing something now he's articulating all these things and of course What he's experiencing is the promise of the Holy Spirit. He's experiencing a power encounter while mowing the yard. So I have to ask you, um, as we talk about this the next couple weeks, have you had an encounter with God like that? Can you look back on your life and you say, that's when I was not just full but I was immersed. If you can say yes, that is the promise we celebrate on Pentecost. If you can't say yes, my prayer for you is that you will experience the purpose and the person and the promise of the Holy Spirit. Here, maybe as we gather, but maybe when you're mowing the yard. I will tell you this. This does not happen if you do not seek him. This does happen if you do seek him. So this week, walk, not just filled, but walk pursuing that promise because it happened at Pentecost and that's what we celebrate today. 3,000 saved, not slayed. Cut to the heart and the spirit, not the sword. Gathered on the mountain or in the city or up the mountain or in Israel, in the upper room, or excuse me, in the upper room. Instructions, empowerment, all of these things 
are today. But all these things, all these things can be for you. What I love about this last part, and I'll just close with this final thought, as you talk about this power encounter, you experiencing God's power in your life in, in full display. Something happens in Acts here that I think we sometimes overlook. For the promise is for you and for your children and all who are far off and everyone who the Lord God calls to himself. This promise I'm talking about, this, this isn't just for me. It's not just for Larry mowing his yard. It's for you and your car. It's for you and your kids. It's for you and your marriage. It's for you. Don't miss the more that God has for you. Seek him and you'll find him. God, I pray for everyone here today that has experienced this encounter with you that is explained only in the unexplainable or the unexplainable being explained rather only in the presence of of the Holy Spirit. God, I pray that those that are here today that would not look at themselves as less because they haven't, they would just simply look as you as more. That you have a promise for them, an empowerment that comes from receiving the Holy Spirit. I just pray, God, this promise of the Holy Spirit would illuminate as your word goes forth, as they hear it, and it stirs that faith for them to wake up and walk in all of they have for you. God, help them not to be satisfied with just being filled, but overflowing. In Jesus' name, I want that for them. I want that for this church. That that cup is a group of people gathered together immersed, surrounded, and the promise of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Next week, we'll talk through more on the person and then the purpose in this three-week series about the Holy Spirit. Have a great day. Thanks for being the church. Meet someone that you don't know on your way out. And we actually ended... Almost on time. Thanks, everybody.